Hi everybody, welcome back to RSA 2024. You're watching theCUBE, our continuous coverage of RSA. The big conference here, four days, about 40, 45,000 people here. I think it's, uh, it's back you know, to its pre-COVID levels. Uh, Tim Van Den Heed is here. He's the Vice President of Global Cybersecurity Services Sales uh, at IBM Consulting, and Dimple Aluwalia is the global BISO. We're going to find out, Dimple, what that means, and Global Senior Partner, Cybersecurity Services, IBM Consulting. Folks, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you, it's B a pleasure. B-I-S-O, what does that stand for? Business Information Security Officer. So oh. it's essentially an extension of the CISO role uh, that organizations have someone who's focused on protecting the organization, our data, our systems, our people, and then making sure that we're good stewards of doing that for our clients um, because they entrust in us. So I get to be the business unit CISO essentially for all of IBM Consulting globally. Ah, okay, great, because kind of you guys had, have had some sex, su success with that role with I know the chief data office, exactly. right? It's sort of similar sort of uh, format. Exactly. So applying, uh, good to see that scaling across IBM and Tim. Explain your role. So I'm responsible for our go-to-market, for our teams in the field, uh, to help our clients uh, understand our value proposition, understand their requirements, and bring that together in solutions that drive your security posture upwards. Okay, so we, know, we all know IBM Consulting. Um, it's where tech meets industry. You guys go deep. You guys are world-class world capabilities. Just zooming out, let's start with the big trends that you see in, in cyber. Obviously, a lot of AI, we heard a lot of that last year. We're, gonna, we're hearing more of it, of course, this year. But the, the big picture is we, every year we spend more. Uh, we we kind of stay the same. I joke, if you were a general manager of a football team, you'd be, you'd be fired for staying the same. But, but that's basically what the industry can do. But what are the big picture trends that you guys are seeing, Temple, in the field? So uh, there's a lot of focus around expansion of cyber in terms of areas that perhaps haven't been uh, cared for as much in the past. A lot you've mentioned in, in terms of investments and or areas of attention have been around traditional IT security. We see that expanding. We see that expanding in a big way around operational technology or OT and making sure that the uh, systems that many of our countries, many of our uh, cities and states operate on, whether those are simple things as our metros or industrial plants or energy and utilities, really protecting that as well. That has always been an area that needed the, the same level of attention and focus, but it wasn't in the scope of traditional CISOs, and we see that expanding from IT to OT security. We also see um, areas where security is being positioned early for conversation as businesses and uh, governments look at expanding their areas and adoption of te new technology. You mentioned AI. You're right. Looking at around in RSA, there's not a single place that I can turn to that doesn't say the word AI. Just like if you recall back in the day, not so much back in the day is around cloud, right? So I think we see that again, um, and then quantum safe again also brings that. So we see security being thought of earlier enough. These days, we're not quite there yet. I think there's a lot of socializing and bridging to do between different stakeholders within an organization so that they fully appreciate what security can be uh, doing for them as an enabler. So we, we see those areas of, of certainly focus. I mean, that IT, OT, very fascinating. Digital world meets the physical world. Um, uh, frankly, as you well know, we're highly exposed in that regard. And, and they have largely been separate. I mean, the way we, we secured, we used to secure the physical world was it, it was just wasn't connected. Yeah. But now it is connected. Yeah. Right. So they were they were they were by design or maybe it was uh, by luck air gapped. No longer are they air gapped. And, and and Tim, what are the big things you're seeing with customers? And I want to get into this NATO example, which maybe touched on some of the things that Dimple was just talking about. Yeah. So. Um, if you look at our clients, uh, our business, our CXO um, counterparts, what they say is, um, we have a lot of innovation to do in our business. That's the way that we grew our business. Now with that comes the responsibility to do it in a secure way. Even for AI, you need to do it in a secure way, but all the traditional stuff that we're still doing, it needs to be secure to the bone. And so, what we've seen is that clients that have a higher growth of revenue over time, also have higher security 
boost your levels. So there's a correlation between how secure they are and how fast they can grow their business. And the reason for that is because they can launch new programs and innovation faster if they address the security problem heads on and by design. So that's interesting. With the previous guest that we just had on, it was a startup. And it's sometimes hard for organizations to get their arms around security as a, a driver of business value, specifically. It doesn't, doesn't throw off a lot of cash, but you've got data that suggests that, that by lowering your risk, you can actually drive more business value. Is that what I'm understanding? Right, and there's a second element to that, is when, when you, any project that you do, whether it's business, security, IT, you will look at what yield you get from a project. Now for security, it has always been challenging to see the value of security because it was seen as an insurance or a policy that you would need to put in. Being able to correlate your risk reduction and monetary value to the investments that you make in security make it a much easier conversation to put it at the forefront of any board level discussion. So I, I want to double click on that because essentially the business case for cyber is the, the, the reduction in the expected loss, right? Okay, so you expect to get hacked. Um, that's probably more prevalent. Uh, the impact is probably greater than it's ever been, so you can quantify that, presumably, by making some assumptions. Right. Are the CFOs buying this? And, and it, obviously it's not across the board, but how are you getting the CFOs to buy into this and in the, in the lines of business to buy into it? Well, so if you, know, you mentioned the notion of expected annual loss, yeah. and so that's how they look at it. You can look at it as, as value or as a cost. And so if you don't address, if you have like 60 programs, you need to prioritize those programs. If you do that from a risk quantified perspective, you can go to the CFO and say, these are the five most critical things we need to go do because they have the biggest impact on our bottom line PL. And that's something they listen to. Do you think that um, when, we, when we talk to customers, you know, there's a big theme in the industry about oh, there's a skills gap. Yeah. Uh, there's too many tools, 50, 75, hundreds of tools installed, and it's just increases complexity. We'd love to consolidate that. We know that's not happening. Actually, people are adding more. Um, are we thinking about it wrong, Dimple, in terms of just so focused on the tools and the technology, not enough on the people, people and the and process? The process? Yeah. And, and how are you helping organizations you know, squint through that maze of, of tooling that they keep layering on? It's like, I live in an old house and there's a lot of layers of paint on my house. <laughs> Every time we have to paint it, it's like, oh. And so it gets worse and worse and worse every time we, we cover up the warts. How are you helping customers deal with that problem? So a couple of ways. Um, when you talk about uh, certainly the people and process side, you're absolutely right, because you can always apply whatever the best of breed technology is. Challenges, if you don't really have a well-defined security program with the right level of governance to understand what it is that you're trying to protect, you can have the best of technologies, but it's not necessarily going to help improve your security posture. So really looking at an integrated program that is uh, applying the right set of technologies that will better support all different aspects of whatever you're trying to protect as an organization. Uh, and then looking at how do you also have the right set of partnerships. And I say partnerships because um, two fronts. One is it's important to always make sure that the providers you're working with share your same methodology, your same uh, focus and, and energy around security, not just as a provider, but also as a company in itself. So it, it helps to kind of say, you know, you share certain characteristics, because um, if, you, if you live and breathe it yourself, more likely you're going to understand what the pain point is for the client and be able to help them do that. Skills, I think, is, is, is in a similar way, is the skills shortage, we've been talking about it for a number of years. The number of uh, open roles continues to, to fluctuate, but the problem hasn't been necessarily solved. One of the areas that I do find encouraging is around public-private uh, sector partnership in that, where we're looking at bringing in individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, life experiences, who can really learn cyber and apply the that knowledge. So if you think about people uh, who, can, who can test uh, for security vulnerabilities, who can look at being able to uh, look at process, business process, and how do you make it inherently more secure. It's this whole notion that even Tim was just mentioning about secure by design. So we're trying to work with our clients in helping them evaluate the skills and talent they have 
and figure out what may be growth areas for them in cyber. Um, and then helping with the enablement and such, and then certainly as a service provider and helping with managed services. Thank you for that answer. So zero trust is kind of, pre-pandemic was a buzzword and then it sort of became this mandate. I, I, it's getting kind of buzzy again. Does zero trust bleed in enough to those business process aspects in your view? Where are we in terms of, of, of zero trust adoption? Do you, do you feel like it's kind of buzzy? Does it have teeth? Um, I, I, I certainly know, I talked to enough CISOs that if you actually take it seriously and you implement it, it's a journey, it doesn't, it's not something you buy off the shelf, so I believe in it, I don't yeah. need to be, yeah. be negative on it, but it's just, it's, a, it's, it's very challenging to operationalize. You're and so right. how, how do you help folks, how do you think about zero trust and how do you help folks operationalize it? Yeah, so we think about it in terms of it is a shared responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Um, like you said, there's no silver bullet or single technology that's going to necessarily solve the problem. Uh, and for us, it's been, uh, where we've seen greater success is being able to bring the line of business uh, leaders because they have a right use case. You want to make sure that you are building something or trying. you understand what it is you're trying to secure. Uh, and then uh, couple that with individuals who have different areas of functional responsibility. So if you think about it, you know, in most cases when it comes to zero trust, a CISO or security leader within an organization is an influencer uh, because they're setting the policy, they're saying you know, these are the type of controls that we need, but really the operational execution of it typically resides with those who are in CIO, uh, organizations with infrastructure responsibility, application development responsibility. So it really, the greater success I've seen is when all stakeholders are in sync and prioritizing it about the same time. How we tend to help is facilitate that conversation honestly, is rather than jumping straight into here are great technologies that we can apply, it's more about we bring those stakeholders together and do what we call design thinking workshops to help make sure there's clarity on what is the outcomes that they want to achieve and then helping them, to your point, is mapping out their journey to do exactly I that. I mean, it, it's no question in my mind it's the right approach. Yeah. But when, when the, you know, the bombs are dropping, we're going to talk about NATO, no, no pun intended, people just say, give me, give me a tool to, to plug that hole and then it's like my barn that I paint every other year. Okay, let's get into the cyber piece of this, Tim. I mean, the NATO piece of this. So you've got this, relationship with NATO, um, they've got certain objectives. Take us through this case study, I'm really interested in this. So, so NATO, North Atlantic, treat organization, uh, threat organization, sorry. Um, I'm going to say 75 years old, 32 countries. Um, the mission is both political as a military. Um, so you can see the complexity of an organization like that across the globe with different countries, different policies, different systems, networks that are <laughs> collaborating together. And they set out to, to go and improve the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are really um, making sure you, you deal with your vulnerabilities. Now in order to be able to deal with your vulnerabilities in such a complex landscape, there's really three things that you need to know. You need to know what are my assets and where are they? What kind of controls do I have on those assets? And how are they patched? Now, if you need to do this in a 50 people organization, it's fairly straightforward. With the, uh, the attack surface that the NATO has, it's quite a different ballgame. So they engaged with us on a three year program to transform that whole concept that I just explained to get full visibility on all their assets, their controls, and their patches in order to drive that vulnerability management program. Because it's a foundation for everything else that they do in terms of systems, applications they build, uh, whether it's, at, and they're going to consume it in their other instruments of power. So um, instruments of power for the NATO are the land, sea, air, space, and now the fifth one is cyber security. But cyber security also taps into the other four because as they deploy uh, into the field, they need to have access to systems, whether it's OT or IT, they need to make sure that the data they're building decisions on and the applications that they're using have a foundation that is, has visibility, transparency, and is kept to date every single moment of the day. So that's the whole program that we're running with them. There's obviously, you mentioned, you referenced this politics involved. Are you able to get kind of consensus on what the priorities are across those different constituencies. How, how were you able to do that? So we, that was not part of our scope. So the NATO themselves, they organized that. But what they did is, because they knew this is um, 
um, it's going to take time to come to go through a process and make a decision you're going to work with. So it took about, I think, a year, a year and a half. So rather than sending out a request for proposal to 10 companies, they had a limited set of companies they went with, and then they did iterative co-creation across um, different towers and different um, phases of the program. What they did is they could tune and, and work with their constituents throughout that period to make sure everybody's, everybody's aligned on what the outcome should be. So they made the decision on what the scope would be, but we helped them obviously shape it throughout the process of the engagement. So they had to figure that out, but you are helping them understand their posture and then really where to apply the resources. Uh, you mentioned patching. I mean, something as basic as, yeah. as patching is yep. actually making that happen. Yep. <laughs> and, and so, what, what, what's the life cycle of this project? When did it start? Where, what, how, where are you in the maturity cycle? So we, we started uh, only a couple of, I'm going to say months ago. Oh, okay. Um, and it's uh, going to be running for three years and then uh, an additional uh, one or two years um, uh, we could extend it into. So here, here we are talking about how technology kind of secondary to people in process, but I want to talk about technology. You mentioned quantum. Um, I heard Jensen say at GTC a couple months ago, maybe it wasn't that long ago, well, you know, most of the stuff that you know, they're talking about in quantum, we can do with AI. And so, of course, a lot of people that I've talked to have said, no, no, that's not true. Particularly, you know, cryptography. But so where does quantum fit in this whole world of cyber? I think it's uh, pretty, pretty high. Uh, there's been a lot of commentary around, is it real? Is it, you know, what, what's going to become of it? Look, quantum computing definitely is real. The business cases and application use cases are being proven day in, day out. Uh, so as that comes about, it's a little bit about, le for me, honestly, it's less about creating a FUD that something is going to happen and be imminent, but there is a defined timeline of when this could become reality around introduction of threats. Particularly as organizations, we talked about patching. Patching is one of the areas that people think about. The other, but there are just as many areas that companies haven't paid attention to. And I think certainly around cryptography, really looking at uh, the encryption that's in place, the type of applications, the type of data, and right now where we're at is having very clear conversations with our clients' boards to help educate them around what is the potential the good sides of it, certainly for adoption of cloud, sorry, uh, quantum computing, but then also looking at quantum safe and how they need to be assessing um, their environment to first understand you can't protect something that you don't know about, right? It's an old, old thing that we've highlighted when it comes to vulnerabilities, but the same thing around quantum safe is really take inventory of what you have in place, understand where your gaps are. As you do technology refreshes, make sure that you're selecting technologies that provide you and advance you in your quantum safe journey, make sure you understand what's the time it's going to take people process. So technology, yes, you could deploy it, but if you have ingrained in your applications and everything in your organization, if you don't look at the people process side, then they're going to be stumbling blocks. And so really that's where we're having the conversation is take inventory of what you have, define a roadmap and a strategy, get the um, stakeholder alignment in your organization because of line of business owners, and then an execution or operational time frame that's appropriate for your organization and for the risk that you're willing to take. Tim mentioned earlier about risk quantification, risk management, right? Mm. It's a risk-based decision, yeah, right. honestly. So I think that's where we've been focusing on with clients before we ever get to the remediation part of it. First start, and, and as a part of your governance framework. Yeah, in Quantum's Real, we, last November, we were invited uh, uh, to the Th Thomas J. Washington Research Center in New York. Yeah. We got the quantum deep dive, and, um, and I, I left there, because I haven't been spending a lot of time in quantum, but I left there saying, wow, this is actually getting real. So I've, I have spent more time trying to understand it. It's, it's, um, there are a lot of different options, a lot of different trade-offs, but it's coming, no question. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank uh, you. Our time flew by, I hope we can have you back. Maybe see you at IBM Think. Looking right. forward to Looking it, forward. see you in Good Boston. Oh, right, you're welcome. All right, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for Shelly Kramer and Dave Linthicum. You're watching theCUBE's live coverage of RSA 2024. We'll be right back after this short break.